Welcome to the Think Big series brought to you by PSG. My name is Anita Hearn. I'm the CEO of Asset Management, a division of PSG. As a leading financial services group, PSG has an extensive national footprint in South Africa and a presence in Namibia. We've been in operation since 1998, so we've seen quite a few market cycles as a firm, and we pride ourselves on providing a bigger picture approach to our clients' financial needs. Whether those needs might be from asset management or a wealth management perspective, and also short-term insurance. Our firm provides clients access to a wide range of insurance and investment products and advice, both proprietary products and solutions, as well as a comprehensive list of third-party products. The Think Big series, which has been running for the past few months, is a collection of dialogues with high-value speakers hosted by award-winning financial journalist Bruce Whitfield. Each topic addresses human truth issues which are causing South Africans anxiety in these uncertain times. What we try to do with this series is to empower you with factual evidence to formulate your own opinion and manage your expectations on how various aspects of the current situation could unfold. In today's webinar, Bruce talks to Tracy Davis, Executive Director of nonprofit shareholder activism organization, Just Share. She's an expert in responsible investment, shareholder activism, and corporate governance. Just Share works with local and international activists and responsible investors on key ESG issues. For those of you not aware of the acronym ESG, it stands for Environmental, Social and Governance. And three of the key issues that Just Share cares a lot about are inequality, climate change and diversity and transformation. An example of Just Share's work and how they've with together with environmental advocates and responsible investors, how they've actually made a difference and placed climate change firmly on the agenda of South Africa's financial sector is that in the past 15 months, they've managed to get all five of the country's biggest banks to adopt fossil fuel financing policies, a huge achievement. Tracy sits on many advisory boards and task teams, including the NBI, National Business Initiatives, Just Transition Pathways Board, and also on the Global Reporting Initi Initiative Human Rights Technical Task Team. She was also a judge on the panel that judged the 2020 Principles for Responsing, Responsible Investing Awards. She writes a column for the Financial Mail every month, and many of her opinion pieces are published regularly in a broad range of South African media. COVID has brought many issues to the fore for us this year, not the least of them being the prevalence of inequality and how the COVID-induced lockdowns have impacted those who were already struggling to start with. It has also led us personally to question excesses, ways of doing things that are ineffective and not climate friendly. We all will look at business travel with new eyes in the future and question why we were doing things in a particular way in the past. To quote from Tracy's July column in Financial Mail, the decisions that governments, investors, and financial institutions make right now are crucial to determining what the post-COVID recovery will look like. Will we grab the opportunity to build back better, or will we continue to barrel our way blindly into climate chaos? Our campaign social media hashtag is hashtag ThinkBigPSG. The series is free, it's shareable, it's open to anyone, Anyone is interested, whether you're a PSG client or not. Over to you, Bruce. Annette, thank you very, very much indeed. Tracy Davies, good to have you with us. Traditionally, shareholder activists are people who go to annual general meetings and shout at management about balance sheet issues. They shout at management about remuneration. Your activism is traditionally seen as the soft stuff. And I think increasingly we're coming to understand that actually it's the stuff uh, that's really important. Thank you, Bruce. The AGM activism is 
is a part of it, but it's we see it very much as the end stage uh, and only one of the tools that we use. It is important to be able to stand up uh, face to face with uh, board members of companies and ask them directly about the, the issues that we are uh, campaigning on. But the engagement and advocacy part of our work, um, I think, as you say, is the more the more effective in many ways, uh, and it's 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 much harder. You know, everything that comes out into the public domain about what we do is really an end result of many many months of extraordinarily careful and in depth research, um, and more importantly, and and often far more in a far more difficult way of of one on one meetings with with management and the boards, uh, sometimes board members of the companies that we are trying to address. Um, and so, you know, we don't just go out, barrel out into the world, into AGMs uh, as a first step to ask questions and, and make noise. Uh, we are present at AGMs, but that is a very small part of what we do. Take me back a little bit before we go forward. And I, you, you train as a lawyer, you work at a Johannesburg law firm, you go and spread your wings, you're admitted as an attorney in England and Wales, so you've got global experience. And then at some point, I think it's in about 2010 or thereabouts, you do something crazy. You get in a vehicle uh, or a bicycle or you walk, I don't know how, but you travel through the continent of Africa for an awfully long time. I mean, you, you sort of disappear for two years off the radar completely. Just take me through why you do that as a professional, because it brings you to a point where you are now. I'm just curious of that journey. Figuratively yeah, and, and absolutely. And, and, and at the time that we did, it was my husband and I, we, we did that shortly after we get, got married. I wish it had been two years. It was only just under one year, unfortunately. Uh, and we were con generally considered to be absolutely mad. We were both working in London um, and I can't think of anyone we knew who didn't have some version of the response of, how can you just stop working, give up your careers and go and do this crazy thing? This is what you do when you're 18. But yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd worked at a, you know, in a in big corporate law firm in Johannesburg uh, to do my articles. And I found that environment fairly bleak, to be honest. And as part of my articles, I spent six months as a public defender in the Hillbrow Magistrates Court. And uh, even though I had, of course, lived in South Africa all my life, uh, I, that was my first real dramatic personal exposure to injustice. And it, it really changed, it changed the way I saw everything. Um, and so I, I, I did a master's degree in New York and then when I went to the UK, I worked as a criminal defense solicitor. So really in that criminal justice system, very, very intensely in the system. Um, but you know, I never thrived in the UK. Uh, I never felt like I was really myself or like I was really amongst my own people. And after we did this incredible trip, we, we drove something like 32,000 kilometers in an old Land Rover, sleeping in a tent on the top of a car, uh, which is very useful in places where lions and things roam wild. Um, you know, just a, a life-changing experience. Uh, every single moment of it was extraordinary. Um, the richness, the color, the experiences, the beauty, the generosity of the people, uh, you know, it just made us so happy to be African. And after all of that, going back to London in November uh, was quite a shock. And, and we realized pretty quickly that neither of us were going to be the kind of, of South Africans who, who immigrated and never came back. And so we came back to South Africa very shortly thereafter. And uh, we not, we've never looked back. We're so happy to be here and we love what we do. And I love the work that I do. And I feel like I'm really in my place with, with my people. That activism though, the seed of the activism is planted in the Hillbrow Magistrates Court. You talk about that as being your first exposure to injustice. Just very briefly, uh, an example or just an overall sense? Wow. So I was, I mean, 22, 23, never set foot in a courtroom in my life before. And on my first day at the Hillbrow Magistrates Court, I had to conduct three criminal trials. Uh, and each of my clients was from a different country in Africa. And none of them could speak English. Uh, and there were no translators at the court that day. Um, so, and this was the daily grind there, you know, just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people 
old women who'd been arrested because they'd gone into a supermarket and put a chicken in their jerseys and walked out because they were starving. Uh, people who'd been arrested for being illegal immigrants, um, women and men who, who, you know, just really were almost universally desperate and were now on top of all of that, embroiled in the criminal justice system, which is at the best of times a desperate place to be. Um, and this was just, I, it just, it just completely blew my mind. I mean, here I came from this very, you know, at that time I was working at a law firm whose offices were in Sandton City, you know, the most kind of glittery, glamorous place we have in South Africa. That was my daily work. I'd drive into the parking lot at Sandton City, walk through the shops, go up to my nice office in the building and, and suddenly I was, you know, in, a, in, a, in this incredible place where there was just this absolute crazy mess of humanity. And um, it, was, it was dreadful, but it was also, it just, it, it was so impossible after that to go back into any kind of bland corporate environment and feel like I was doing anything useful in the world. Uh, that experience then has taken you through the UK, the travel experience. Does the Africa trip, I mean, for many people, it changes them. It seems to me that the Africa trip sort of cements a path already that you, you were on. I mean, you were already taking a, an unusual career path for a corporate lawyer. Um, this just confirmed, I'm sure, everything that you believed needed to be done. Were you then starting to think about becoming more active as an activist, or did that evolve later? Yes, absolutely. And I mean, you know, you don't really ever think of yourself as deciding to become an activist. Um, so I'd been following the work very closely of the Center for Environmental Rights, which is an environmental legal NGO in South Africa, uh, who were just doing extraordinary work around mining and the environment. Um, and that was something that I was also exposed, cared a lot, already cared a lot about and was also exposed to quite a lot on, on our trip. Um, and so I came back and, and applied for a job there, didn't get it, but I tried, tried again a few months later and, and, and did get a job there. So worked there for five years as a, as a public interest environmental lawyer. Um, and that was really my first exposure to activism, to social justice activism, to environmental justice activism. You know, I, uh, and it was a huge change. Um, and it was, it was really quite new to me because I didn't, as you said, you know, I did a law degree, I was in a corporate environment, even in the UK, as a criminal defense lawyer, you know, you wouldn't call that activism. Um, and so I, I, it, it took me a long time to feel kind of comfortable in that space and comfortable speaking of myself as an activist. Um, but that is now what I think of myself as, and, and it feels like it's bizarrely where I was meant to end up. How do you get attention as an activist? I mean, we used to Greenpeace activism, uh, where you get into a rubber dinghy, you put your, your body and your life on the line and you go and block the whalers from whaling, for example. That's how to get attention. Um, as a white middle-class South African woman who uh, is, you know, went, you know, went to the right university, worked at the right firm, suddenly you're knocking on corporate doors to say, hi, I'm here to change the way you do things. I mean, what stops the door being slammed in your face? Yeah, so on the one hand in South Africa, being an activist, being, as you say, a white middle-class activist is, is problematic for all sorts of reasons. Um, but on the other hand, that, that background that I have, uh, and particularly the legal background, I think, um, means that I, I A, am quite comfortable in those environments, even when they're very uncomfortable, which they usually are, um, but also that I, I, I can, and, and that is, you know, what the work that we do is very much founded on using the same, the language that the corporate sector understands, you know, and, and so the Greenpeace kind of activism is phenomenally important in the world, um, but it's, it, it, it doesn't get into the heart of, of the corporate kind of, well, into the, the heart of, of the corporate sector, and so what we, what we, I, I'm actually fairly surprised, to be honest with you, that doors are not slammed in our face more often. Um, and I have to say this for the South African corporate sector, that, that all, for the most part, um, even if what you're saying is very unpleasant to them, and even if they no doubt secretly despise and, and hate us, um, they are almost unfailingly polite and professional, you know, and I think that's that's been a big part of, of, of why we have had the successes that we've had, 
because we really do pride ourselves on, on being professional, uh, not being accusatory and shouty and, and personally insulting and all of that kind of stuff, but simply trying to engage with people on a very rational level and say, this is in many instances, this is what the law says, uh, you know, and, and you're not even doing that. Um, so how do, we, how do we change that? The power of fact in argument. I think is insurmountable. And that's the power of it, isn't it? Uh, to be steely, to be calm, and to be analytical. And I think that's the approach you've taken, is a fact-based approach. You can shout facts or you can speak facts. And you can either shout from the outside or speak from the inside. And I think you've chosen the latter. Yes, and, and I have to say as well that we haven't, we don't do that alone. So one of the most interesting things to me about the work that we do and, and what I've discovered over the past three or four years, um, I mean, no doubt it's obvious to you, but, but it, it, you know, when you come from a very activist background, you do tend to end up thinking that the corporate sector is pretty nasty and everyone in it is pretty mean, um, which of course is, is a very simplistic view of the world. And, and all, of the, all of the corporations that we engage with, all, all of the private sector, of course, there are very good people in those organizations who totally get these issues um, and very, very strongly want to progress them, but don't hold the kind of power within those organizations that allows them to do so. And so we found over and over again that our kind of external activism and internal engagement has given those people more power within the organization to, to raise the profile of climate change, diversity and transformation, wage inequality, corporate governance, et cetera, because they're able to say to the boards and to the executives, I told you this was important. You didn't listen to me. Now look what's happening to us. We need to do something about that. And I think that's actually the most powerful element of this. How do you pick your fights? Because there are so many fights to be fought. How do you identify you know, is it like a Maslow's hierarchy of activism <laughs> needs or something like that? No, I think, you know, climate change really, first of all, is just the most obvious one in the global context now because it is so urgent. And really, when we started in this space four years ago, uh, the South African corporate sector, the financial sector, institutional investors, they really were not not stepping up on this issue. Many of them hadn't even thought about it. Um, so, so that is, uh, you know, there was a real gap, I think, in the South African space for that kind of shareholder activism on climate change, which has, you know, really driven progress in the rest of the world on, on climate action. And then, of course, inequality, diversity and transformation. We live in South Africa, you know. Uh, you can't possibly operate as an activist in this country without... Uh, without tackling those issues, huge and dynamic as they are. Um, and what we always emphasize as well, of course, is the interconnection between inequality and climate change, because the, you know, the, the general South African um, response to climate activism is, we, we can't think about this, you know, our economy is tanking, we've got so many people unemployed, this is such a disaster, what on earth are you talking about coming to me with this environmental issue? But, you know, there's a two-pronged response to that. The first is that the impacts of climate change are going to make all of those problems worse. And the second is that the economic opportunities that are open to us if we embrace the transition to a low-carbon economy instead of holding on desperately to this old fossil fuel system um, are extraordinary. You know, there's just this, this amazing kind of panorama of opportunities in front of us. And, and as, a, as, as our government and our private sector, we just seem incapable of embracing that, uh, which we find extremely frustrating. I, I was just chatting to somebody recently who was talking to me about Denmark's green uh, transition and how Denmark had become a green energy producer and had become self-sufficient from a green perspective and now was exporting its green technologies to China, for example. And suddenly it becomes a business opportunity. It doesn't all have to be about ticking boxes and compliance and compliance and, and kumbaya and making the environment better, which is the first purpose. But there can be a business imperative. There can actually be an, a financial incentive to do good. And I think that's where you come from. Absolutely. And, and the, you know, climate change is this kind of explosive um, uh, cluster of risks um, and what our uh, institutional investors in South Africa and, and regulators a little bit 
are really starting to understand that primarily it, it is an economic risk. You know, um, we are putting our export market viability at risk by clinging on to coal. We are, you know, we've, I, I was, it was devastating to read that, you know, the outgoing CEO of BMW, one of his biggest regrets was failing to persuade the government to embrace electric vehicle technology, you know. Um, I mean, we have, we have, we have land, we have labor, we have innovate, we have extraordinary entrepreneurs, we have innovation, we have a huge, you know, kind of foundation of people who are poised to make this change. But what they need is the regulatory incentive and the investment imperative to get going. Uh, and it's, I mean, and, and it's again, part of a, a very long and drawn out and painful and patient process, because you begin this process with South Africa's banks, I think four years ago, and you start saying to them, guys, you can't keep funding coal-fired power stations. You have to be thinking about a green future and an energy future. And you would have faced different levels of resistance within different organizations, but you've succeeded. The slow, patient approach. But don't you sometimes just want to stand in the middle of a boardroom table and you know knock some heads together? Absolutely, we do. And uh, and the way that we, you know, the, the, you you can see a version of that in the escalation of some of our campaigns. But um, you know, we, we we have succeeded to a large extent. So we've made a stack of progress over the past couple of years. Um, but we certainly haven't we haven't won this battle, and and the next the next big battle uh, in Africa actually not just in South Africa, is this argument that you know Africa hasn't had an opportunity to develop its oil and gas and resources in particular. You know we've now got oil and gas in Uganda, Tanzania, Mozambique, off the coast of South Africa, Total. You know this uh, uh, game. What what does Mr. Mantashe call it a game changer for the economy, et cetera, et cetera. A game, a game changer. You've got to get, <laughs> you've got to get really gruff. Sorry, yeah, game right, changer. Right, right, right. <laughs> bro, bro, bada. Um, and oh, Lepert, bada, yeah. uh, and these places Please. that are swear words to you, yes. <laughs> they are, because it's 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 insane, right? Um, Africa shouldn't be saying, we need to catch up. We need to, we need to have our chance at fossil fuels. Uh, it should be leapfrogging and saying, you guys, you, you messed this up. Look at the opportunities we have. We're going to move straight to the next stage of this, you know. And, and it's a, there's an infuriating um, uh, kind of myth going on at the moment in, in, in the South African business uh, kind of press and everything about there's these gas fines. You know, they're going to transform the economy. They're going to create all these jobs. They, they really are not, and, and, and primarily that is because we won't see them coming online for at least 10 years, probably 15 years. Um, and at that point, you know, if we haven't properly transitioned to, to renewable energy in a, in a really big way, uh, then we're going to have we're going to have bigger problems on our hands than, 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 than where, to, where to put that gas, you know. So there, there is a place for some gas in the transition to a low carbon economy, mm -hmm. that is for sure. Um, but we do not need to be opening up these new fields. Um, we don't need to be extracting oil from Uganda and Tanzania uh, to, by the way, pipe it to China. How that aids African development, I don't know. Um, you know, so so we 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 feel like we've we've almost killed coal, <laughs> almost I say almost. Um, but now the big the big kind of looming the next fight, and this is not just here; it's globally, is about gas. Talk to me, let's get to gas in a moment, but political transition and the importance of political transition. We saw Donald Trump come to power in the United States as president four years ago. Um, he immediately goes about changing a whole bunch of stuff. And one of those things is to remove the United States from the pa Paris uh, Agreement on climate change. The first thing that Joe Biden says he is doing uh, on his first day in office is going straight back in. That strikes me as massively significant because I, I think the climate change battle has been severely damaged by American intransigence in, in recent years. It has, um, even though when Donald Trump was, well, still is, but you know, when, when he was very much in power. Uh, he, we, he still thinks he's in power he's, and he will he, be in power and he'll be bigly in power for an awfully long time. Yes, Exactly, in his own mind, hopefully only. Um, yeah, you know, Climate activists the world over kind of, uh, we kidded ourselves, I think, a little bit in thinking that we, it, what he did, not that it didn't matter, but that it wasn't going to be the game changer. But, you know, all the economic, the, the sort of climate 
economists and modelers and scientists and everyone really started saying in the last four or five months um, that if Donald Trump is re-elected, we can kiss the goals of the Paris Agreement goodbye. And so it was very interesting, actually, that, you know, even though uh, Trump withdrew from the Paris Agreement very quickly, it there's, a, there's a lag before you're actually out. <laughs> Hopefully, I guess, they hope people will change their mind. Um, and that happened, you know, I think it was just the day before the election or the day after or something like that. And then, you know, when, when, when Biden was, was, was confirmed as having won, I know that everybody breathed a sigh of relief, but from a climate point of view, it was literally like a fist had been lifted off the planet. Because suddenly, everyone who is working on this all over the world, from Mark Carney and Michael Bloomberg to little people like me, this whole new potential opened up. Actually, maybe now we really can make progress, you know? And so it is significant. It's enormously significant. And I don't think we, we even really know how significant it is. And we won't know until Biden is in office and is able to start, you know, making the right noises about climate action. I mean, for, for many years, people have sort of seen climate as other people's problem, but I mean, increasingly so, and it's been brought to light over the last 50 years. David Attenborough, for example, has done a remarkable job of, of documenting change and documenting the way in which the planet is changing. There's still denialists, of course, about the fact that, you know, well, climate has always changed. We went from, in through an ice age, for goodness sake, this is just a natural cycle. But humanity's impact, of course, on the globe and the fact that there are more than 7 billion of us and projected to go, what, to 10 billion by 2050 does suggest that we are in a, a, a tight spot. And for South Africa, we've got some filthy companies. We've got some of the filthiest companies in the world. Now, I'm going to name them, and PSG <laughs> might not like it, but if you look <laughs> at the, the Sassels of the world, and they've recently said, you know what, we don't like the way in which we've been pressured to, to change our practices. We, we don't change, but we get to change our own way. So we can talk about that. We can talk about companies like Sappy, for example. Um, and we can talk about ESCOM. ESCOM is, is a great culprit um, when it comes to, to carbon emissions. I mean, and that's just the obvious ones. Yeah, and, and you know, it's not just carbon emissions. Uh, I mean, ESCOM and, and Sassel and SAPI actually um, also spew out all sorts of other extraordinarily toxic uh, uh, pollutants into the air. Um, the state of health of the big sways in Pumalanga, where all of our coal-fired power stations are, you know, the, the people in, who live in those places um, almost universally suffer from some form of, of respiratory disease. Um, you know, so that there's, there's the environmental, you know, the non-climate environmental impact of these industries as well. And, you know, that, so climate change is, is of course, you know, the dominant and, and the big uh, environmental challenge that we face, but it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's combined with this, biodiversity loss, habitat destruction. Um, you know, we've, we've operated for so long as if, uh, as if you know, the, 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 um, the living world is separate from the economic world, right? And completely ignored the fact that every economic activity we undergo is, is underpinned by and founded on our natural system. And so, you know, the whole, really the whole point of, of environmental, social and governance practice and responsible investment and integration of these other factors into investment decision making is to try and, and make people realize that these companies, uh, you know, they may be making you a profit, you may see your, your portfolio going, going up in, in value or in the case of Sassel, possibly not so much anymore. Um, but, but, you know, there is a cost to that. And we don't calculate that cost in our GDP figures and, and all of those things. You know, we don't calculate the cost to our health system from the impacts of air pollution. We don't calculate the extraordinary costs already imposed on our society by the climate change that's already happening. Droughts, heat waves, all of excessive rainfall, all of those things. Now, these things are already impacting us severely. It's not something that's only going to happen in the future. And that's a really hard sell to people, to investors who have had lousy returns from a South African investment portfolios for, for a long time, who may have offshored some of their wealth and may be doing okay. But they look at future returns. They're not getting any younger, many people. They may be in retirement already. And they're very keen to preserve their capital. They're very keen to get a decent return because, of course, 
they've got the personal vested interest of ensuring that they can uh, that their money outlasts their, their lifetimes. And so there is a lot of pressure, I recall in the early days of Theo Boerter's activism, for example, then he would go into uh, annual general meetings and uh, executives would quake because he'd bound to find something on line 37 of a financial statement somewhere that he could beat them with. But he wasn't universally popular. It was a case of why ruin the party for everybody else? Why do you guys come here? And actually all you're doing is just causing trouble. It, 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 that's not our problem. The uh, Crancheron will sort this out. Science will sort it out. It'll resolve itself. Be patient. These things take time. Uh, and I, I guess a lot of people aren't particularly grateful for the sort of work that you do. No. And, 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 and I don't really get it either, to be honest with you. Um, and, and I encounter this in my, my personal life and in our you know, we, we do a lot of work with uh, with philanthropic foundations as well, or we work, we interact with them a lot. And and there's even that disconnect there, right? So you've got you've got big philanthropic foundations across the globe whose ma whose mission is to improve the environment or some element of, of human uh, the human condition. Um, but when you tell them that the the investments of which they're drawing the income which they're funding those things are causing the same harm that they're trying to fight. Um, they completely flip out, right? They, they don't want to play with that. They don't want to mess with that. And, and I mean, my favorite, favorite and worst element of this work is that you spend so much time explaining to people how, you know, ESG investing will not cause you to lose, uh, you know, it, it will not have a negative impact on your returns. And there are hundreds of studies that show this now. Um, you know, it, it may not be as fast or as dramatic uh, as you would like in some cases, uh, but in general, you won't lose money from it. But, you know, the, the implication of that is that, that previously or, or generally we say, I don't really care about the impact of my, of my money making. You know, I don't care if some human being somewhere else or some environment somewhere else is destroyed in order to get me this return. All I care about is this return. And, and where we're getting to as a planet now, is that ignoring that stuff for so long uh, is coming back to bite all of us, you know, because, because the impacts are now becoming too big to ignore. We also, I mean, there's a <laughs> level of activism which happens um, at a very high level and you get into boardrooms and everybody's on their best behavior and you can go in and you can make an intellectual argument, you can speak their language, you can lawyer them uh, to, to the very best of your, uh, your ability and you can make a convincing argument there. However, there are lots of people who sit in communities which are off the beaten track, which are out of the eye of social media. And maybe one day a carte blanche camera will turn up for 30 seconds and, and tell a particular story, but that will pass and another tragedy will overtake them and other things happen. But talk to me about somebody who's, I think, moved you very, very deeply. And that is a woman called Fikile Mchangase, who was murdered the other day as an activist in a community opposing uh, mining in her community. The story of Fiki Ling Changasi, I think, is one that is symbolic of so much of what is wrong with the broad-based exploitation of resources with complete disregard for the communities where this exploitation occurs. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a devastating, devastating state of affairs. You know, a 63-year-old woman gunned down in her home in KZN. Um, for opposing the expansion uh, of, a, of a, a coal mine, first of all. So, you know, not something we really need, although it's not thermal coal, it's metallurgical coal, which is something we get told often is a very important distinction. Um, on the borders of the Fukui and Pelosi National Park, you know, if, if we have a national treasure, that is it. Um, and in a, in a community where, you know, people have seen very little, if no benefit from this mining operation, and in fact, their lives, their livelihoods, their standards of living have decreased, you know, since this mine came. And so this is a, perhaps for environmental activists in South Africa, and there are many of them who focus on, on mining and its impacts on the environment and on the communities that live around mines. The most frustrating thing about this country is this persistent, constantly, deployed narrative by government, by the mining sector, that mining will come to you and it will make your life better. 
you know. Uh, so don't complain, don't object. We will we will sort you out. You're poor. You live in a hut. You have four goats, and you 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 grow your own mealies. There's no possible way that you would want to live like that. Um, we're going to come and, and we're going to make things better for you. Now, if you can name a community in South Africa that lives next to a mine, which lives in conditions that are better than it did before the mine came along, I'll buy you an expensive dinner because there isn't one. Uh, there really is not one. Uh, if you look at Rustenburg, if you look at Marikana, if you look at Mkumalanga, if you look at KZN and the mining, if you look at the Eastern Cape, I mean, the, the Northern Cape with the diamond mining, I mean, the conditions that people that are inflicted on these people are desperate. And in the very rare instances where people find the strength and power to object to that, because the power imbalance between them and the companies and the government, of course, is vast. In the very few instances where they find the courage to object, they put themselves in mortal danger. And Fakile in Shanghai is not the first person who's been murdered for objecting to mining. Um, no one is ever held accountable for these murders and for these deaths and for the threats. These people are on their own and the people who always get the benefit of the doubt no matter what they say or do are the mining companies and their executives and it is the most extraordinary travesty of justice how often are you accused of standing in the way of progress every day <laughs> every single day everything we do uh, is construed by some people as anti-development anti-growth anti-jobs um, and you know, it's it's just it's just how we are perceived, what we are perceived to be doing. We have a we have a narrow interest. We are we don't understand how the economy works. We don't understand business. We don't understand growth and and the need to 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 grow um, to grow our economy and to create jobs. Um, and and you know, we just we have these weird weird crazy ideas that that don't work in the real world. But you know, <laughs> the the irony of that is that what we're proposing is actually a solution to so many of those problems in our economy, uh, if, if they would only be embraced, you know? Yeah, and, and, and fortunately, and I think South Africa is notoriously short-termist in its thinking, I mean, from the days of the Rand Lords who were in it, uh, you know, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, uh, you know, take as much of a return as you can, disappear back to Blighty, um, and you make your return and, and live in, in luxury for the rest of your life. We've had that short-termism, I think, perpetually. Um, and right now we're sitting in a global crisis. We're sitting in a crisis in South Africa where in 2020 the economy could shrink by between 9 and 10 percent, where you know, up to 3 million people have lost their jobs, where we have an enormous short-term crisis that we, I feel, are almost willing to plug at almost any cost. Um, and that makes the job of the activist saying, but guys, guys, in the long term, but in the long term we're all dead, said John Maynard Keynes. So how do we... How do we find the balance? Yeah. Look, I actually think that we've got to the point now where what we're talking about is, is not so long term anymore. Um, if you look at uh, at ESCOM and the uh, the kind of opportunities that that there exist that are starting to emerge for for ESCOM, you know, transforming itself into into, into a different kind of entity. Um, using, you know, climate finance as a way to bolster its reserves while it transitions to a low carbon entity, that kind of thing. Um, you know, at this point, if we if we come out of this crisis, if we think we're going to come out of this crisis by investing in fossil fuels, um, that is not going to be a long term problem. That is going to be a problem in the next two to five years when suddenly we can't export coal anymore. Because as is already happening, India says, sorry, we've actually got so much renewable energy now, we don't need your coal, which is already happening. You know, our coal export market disappears. We've now invested all this money uh, in, in, in gas, which we won't see for 15 years. So what do we do in the meantime? You know, the point about renewable energy is that we could start tomorrow. You know, we could build factories. We can train people. We can build, we, we could explode our economy with renewable energy, and we could start tomorrow if the vested interests didn't just put stakes in the way at every single turn. It is the solution to South Africa's economic crisis. It absolutely is. Whether it will be embraced or not, much harder to tell.
Viewer questions, because what we did was before we got hold of you, we said to viewers um, who are going to be joining us today, um, please send us your questions. Tracy Davis, she's an activist, she does things, and um, they ask questions. And so I like in that context this question, and it's you can take it any way you like. You could take it from a social perspective, a political perspective, an economic perspective, all of them, an activism perspective, a green perspective, I don't know. But what will South Africa look like 10 to 15 years from now? Question one. So, you know, I think in our space, uh, what we hate most is people who have power to make things better and don't use it. And there are many of those people in this country. And this world, so, um, let's, let's face it, I mean, there is oh, a world course, full of people. Of politicians are of no. a, a particular cut, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and that applies to the, to the public sphere and to the private sphere. And so what South Africa looks like in 10 to 15 years depends very much on whether those people with power, how they use that power. Do they use it to tackle climate change, embrace the renewable energy, um, really meaningfully deal with inequality and diversity and transformation in this country? Or do we just keep carrying on the way we've carried on, which let's face it, hasn't made much difference to anything in the past 20 years when we think about things like inequality. Um, so there are choices that need to be made, and, and that is so much about what we do. We try to say to people, you know, you have the power to make a huge difference here, whether you're the PIC investing trillions of rands on behalf of millions of ordinary people. Where is the PIC in our national dialogue on inequality, on climate change? They have so much power, they don't use it. Where are our corporate executives? Why are they not talking themselves about wage inequality? You know? Where is the government? Why is it not? There are, I could sit here and list a hundred things that the government could do, which would improve all sorts of areas around corporate governance, inequality and climate change that they just don't do. So, you know, you can't just leave it up to us to do this stuff. You know, South Africans should be demanding that these people use their power. How, what okay question number four i'm skipping to that one what can we do what can i do what can anybody watching this presentation do to make a real and meaningful impact in multiple facets of the issues that you tackle yeah so in, in the context of the work that i do uh people who have any kind of money invested <laughs> and that's many many most middle class people right um, have and, and many, many working class people as well in, in pensions, et cetera. You know, if you have money invested in the South African economy and the South African stock market, you have power. You have power to say to financial advisors and pension fund trustees, I, am, I care about climate change and I care about inequality and I want you to use my money to do something about it. So we have what asset managers in this country call the spiral of death where they don't get any demands. They say, we don't get any demands from our clients uh, to be taking these issues seriously. So, you know, what can we do? And then the asset owners and the clients say, but they don't tell us, you know, what the issues are and where they can make a difference. And so nobody ever does everything, you know? I mean, you can, as a simple step, you know, the very first simple step, you can write to your email or pick up the phone to whoever manages your money and say, what are you doing about these issues? Do you know about, Sassel and X and the banks and Y and all of these kinds of issues. You know, and what are you doing about it? I've seen you refer to it before as investor power for a fairer South Africa. And it's really catchy, short um, and to the point. So it is about saying, I, you know, I can move my money at any point from one asset manager to another, one that aligns with my values. And let's get a shout at us. But that's OK, um, because <laughs> everybody needs to be taking this deadly seriously in terms of uh, what the future looks like for kids, grandkids and generations. I mean, so often, and again, I heard somebody say this the other day, we behave like descendants. We behave like we've inherited this mess and it's not our fault. And if we took more of a mindset of the ancestor mindset and said, hold on a second, we are the ancestors of future generations, we might face a whole lot of stuff and tackle things completely differently. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, um, I mean, I don't know if you've heard of a man called Anant Giri Daradas. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. He's an American author. And the American Institute of Directors, stupidly, I think they think now, invited him to speak at their annual event a few weeks ago. Um, and and he, 
he'll have basted this huge room full of American executives and said, you know, where were you when, when the climate crisis happened? Where were you, um, you know, when basically just listing all the big crises faced in the world and asking them, where were you? What did you do? And do you know that the generation coming up behind you is going to view you as having failed them if you don't take these issues seriously and act on them, you know? And, and the, again, just to go back to the fact that the power that resides in those individual human beings that sit on the boards of our listed companies, the power that resides in them to call for things to be better, to take action for things to be better, is so extraordinary. And we see them use it so infrequently. When we, and again, another question, and I'm going through these now and just sort of looking at transformation, diversity in South Africa. We spent an awfully long time talking about climate and climate change, and it's the big issue that everybody faces together. But diversity is that other issue, the change in, in the way in our profiles of our companies. The specific question is, what is restricting transformation and diversity at large corporates? Is it a skills deficit, or is it a culture preference, or other considerations? Is it blatant racism? I mean, if you blood. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't think there's a single right answer to that, um, but I do think that there are a number of factors that contribute to that. Um, you know, we, we talk about diversity and transformation at the corporate level, particularly at the board level, mainly in terms of race and gender. Um, but there's a much even more important element of diversity that we should be thinking about, and that is diversity of thought. And I think that to a large extent, our um, you know, very powerful uh, directors on, on, on South African companies, it doesn't, it, they, they may be much more uh, diverse from a race and gender point of view than they were 10 or 20 years ago, although not nearly enough, and I'll get to that now. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's a whole new body of thinking about things within that space, right? And I think people recruit people to these positions who think like them and who aren't going to challenge them too heavily. Um, so that is a big problem. Uh, and that means that you, you don't get in the kind of younger or more diverse, different voices. You get the corporate voice, you get the auditors and the lawyers and the people, you know, it's all the same people from the same backgrounds, regardless of, of race and gender to me to much of an extent. However, in terms of actual numbers, I mean, it's really, it's really quite amazing how um, you know, the, I don't know if you've heard of the 30% club, which is a kind of global club that aimed to get 30% of um, directors on corporate boards to be women by 2020. So we have a local South African chapter and uh, they recently launched their 2020 report. And, you know, we're at like 26, 27% women on the boards of South African companies. So first of all, they haven't reached that target, but second of all, why is it 30%? You know, do you think, Women don't make up 30% of the population, you know, so we, we don't question these things. Why is it considered sufficient for corporate boards in South Africa to be 50% black? The, co the country is not 50% black. Why is the, the maximum target 50% black people on the board, you know? So we're starting off at a low bar. And then on top of that, our regulators are useless at saying anything about this, doing it. I mean, we have laws. The JSE has regulations about this. You know, the, there are ways to push this agenda and make it happen, but they just don't do it. Nobody does why, it. And so why, why is it so hard? It needs laws. It needs pressure. It needs big changes. No one, no, there is no instance in the history of humanity where corporate power has voluntarily given up some of that power. You know, it doesn't happen voluntarily. That's why my organization exists. We've had 40 glorious COVID-free minutes. We haven't discussed <laughs> it once, um, but it is the elephant in the room. Um, it is the great disruptor of 2020 and the great disruptor for possibly, if we'd manage it badly, decades ahead. Is this a practice run for the bedlam to come if we make bad choices? Yes, it is. Uh, it absolutely is. And I think, um, you know, it was interesting at the start of the pandemic, uh, the kind of global um, responsible investors, shareholder activism community, and it's a big community, um, really the response was, oh, goodness, this is going to just set us back decades. Everyone's just going to say we have to focus on this pandemic. We have to do everything we can to, do, to deal with it and, and everything else must go by the wayside. Um, 
but actually the opposite has happened. Uh, you know, there, I think I think that that for the first time ever, um, COVID has has kind of helped people to clock that we can't keep doing things the way we've always been doing them. Um, and that our economic choices, our personal choices, the way our globe works, um, those have imp those have impacts, you know, they have consequences. Um, so yes, it is a practice run. And yes, who knows how well or badly we will come out of it. I think uh, the chances are, are, are much are, are much more positive and optimistic now that, that Donald Trump won't be won't be leading that charge. Or not leaving it as the case may be, but um, it, it it is it is a, it is a, a practice run, as you say. And um, but again, I think it's important to say it's not COVID is happening now, and climate change will happen then. Climate change is also happening now, you know, already. It's just that most middle class people are not directly impacted by it yet. Well, it's so terribly comfortable. You just turn up the air conditioning, or turn down the air conditioning, turn on the heater. I mean, get an extra raincoat, um, you know, you get a nice broad brimmed hat, whatever you need, and the problem is exactly. way. Um, very curious as to what you think of the World Economic Forum and the theme for 2021, um, which would have been a Davos, but there's a bug going about, so they're not going to be gathering next year. But uh, the Great Reset, and it's a, it's catchy. Um, it, it, it talks to um, what the global elites want to talk about. Is, is it useful, do you think, in terms of, Global elites being told to think about a great reset. I see you bristling, which is a good thing. <laughs> no, look, I mean, I, I think I think Davos is useful. It's become more useful because they have opened themselves up to different kinds of interaction. Greta Thunberg, Radka Bredman, you know, those kinds of people. They're they're letting them letting them speak, much as many may uh, may disrupt that. I still. It, 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 again, though, it goes back to the voluntariness of all this. You know, it's an assumption that these are all good-hearted people who will voluntarily give up power and money to make the world a better place. Um, again, you know, they're not they're not all mean-spirited, nasty people, but that's just not how human beings work. You know, so it's like at the beginning of this year, we had that huge business roundtable in America announcing that it was adopting stakeholder capitalism and that Milton Friedman's stuff was out the window and, you know, they, they're not going to focus on, on, on people and planets. And, and I mean, <laughs> analyses of, of those companies and how they've treated workers during COVID have shown that they actually performed worse than the companies that didn't sign up to that thing in the first place, you know. So, fine, have these meetings, make these, make these pledges, say the right things, but for God's sakes, please do something afterwards, you know? Uh, I saw a great ad on your LinkedIn feed. It was for Kuwai. Now, Kuwai fast food business. It likes to build itself as, as healthier than the rest. And it's got a, a very strong ethos. And for people to say, oh, I can't wait for COVID to be over. I just want to go back to normal. I like the repost of Kuwai to that saying, uh, don't go back to normal. That's very simple. Don't go back to normal. Because yes. going back to normal takes us back to a really destructive long-term path. It does. And, and that's the really weird irony of COVID is that it's opened up a really immediate and huge opportunity for all of us to do things differently, to take these things seriously. You know, you can't help but feel that it's some kind of sign or message from somewhere, uh, you know, that, you know, you guys, you've been really stupid, but, and we're going to make things really nasty for you. But if you, if you think about it carefully, and if you use your massive brains uh, for once to do something, you know, positive and good and future looking and caring for the planet and the people that you live with, it will give you a second chance, you know, um, but it's, it's, it's just scary to think that that we might not take that chance and that we might just go back to normal. Tracy Davies, thank you very much. I think it's a good point to stop. Annette Ahern, um, who is frantically going through portfolios and making sure that all the investments are ESG compliant. Back to you. Thank you very much, Bruce. All I can say is, well, let it not be said that the Think Big series shies away from uncomfortable truths and uncomfortable conversations. We all want to live in a more equal society because inequality, while it may not touch us directly, can touch us indirectly because of the consequences of inequality. We want to live in a world with thriving natural systems that are not doomed by climate change. But these things don't happen spontaneously. We need to make them happen. 
So Tracy's message to us today is don't leave it up to the NGOs and the activists. Take steps within your own sphere to make change the status quo. For me, if I think about COVID during the past year, it's a bit like, I don't like swimming in a cold water, but sometimes you dip your toe in and sometimes someone gives you a shove. And I think this year, COVID gave all of us a big shove to make some changes. So when it comes to your finances, um, one thing does remain, we live in very uncertain times. A competent financial advisor during these times can be invaluable and they can have those uncomfortable conversations with you. They can provide a layer of objectivity by taking into account various scenarios and help you to make a considered rational decision on your wealth, your insurance portfolios, on your future. If you have an advisor, I strongly encourage you to engage with them before you wind down for 2020. And if you don't have one, I strongly encourage you to find one. We welcome your feedback, so please communicate with us. And this was the last of our webinars for 2020. We hope you've enjoyed watching the series with us. Please look out for the next set of Think Big series webinars that we've scheduled for 2021. If you're taking a break, enjoy, stay safe, take a deep breath, and get ready for 2021.